This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 25. Coming up on Space Time. A giant asteroid impact crater discovered in Western Australia. A new discovery of matter-antimatter asymmetry. And giant X-ray chimneys discovered at the core of the Milky Way. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists have discovered a massive 12 to 16 kilometer wide asteroid impact crater in Western Australia. The findings, reported in the journal Meteoritics and Planetary Science, is one of two newly discovered impact structures unearthed by the same team, with the other located in Central America. The Australian discovery was made at Yellily, just north of Jinjin. Researchers from Curtin University identified the buried crater after investigating surface rocks called breccia. Scientists were able to identify telltale microscopic evidence of shock quartz from the breccia, formed as a direct result of an asteroid impact. The authors believe the impact happened during the Cretaceous era, about 85 million years ago. The second crater was discovered in thick jungle in the Central American nation of Nicaragua. One of the study's authors, Dr. Aaron Cavosi from Curtin School of Earth and Planetary Sciences, says his team received a sample of black impact glass about the size of a marble. When they examined it, they discovered the sample contained shocked zircon, features only found in structures formed by impact. The authors used argon dating to determine the impact occurred about 80,000 years ago. Kavosi says it was amazing to find solid evidence of a meteorite impact in such a tiny sample. The Yalili impact crater in Western Australia, the new one we just discovered, is about 100 k's north of a town called Jinjin, which itself is north of Perth. So if you're in Perth, it's only a two or three hour drive to get up there. It's pretty easy to find. And of course, Jinjin's the location of the gravitational observatory. There's a lot going on in that area. Indeed. What made people look for this particular crater in the first place? Well, this one was a tough nut to crack. They say in science that you stand on the shoulders of giants, and this is a case like that. There were reports from about 20 years ago where some researchers at University of Western Australia and uh, the WA Museum had described a possibility of a buried impact crater in this area, and that means that nothing of the crater itself is exposed. What they found was a little bit of a funny rock called breccia. We can talk more about that later. And they made some preliminary studies on it. There was also an oil company that drilled the feature and found some unusually disturbed rocks where they shouldn't have been. And so there was an indication that something was going on here. But at the time, they didn't have enough evidence to confirm what it was. And the opportunity arose to go there and take a better look. And uh, what'd you find? Well, you know, we came into this with new eyes. One of the things that uh, we do at the Space Science and Technology Center at Curtin is we study the kind of evidence, the kind of damage that happens to rocks and minerals that's unique to the impact process. It's really quite startling how much damage at all scales from kilometer scale down to a millimeter or even smaller scale an impact does. An impact creates such strong pressures and forces that some cases the atoms of minerals can get rearranged and form other minerals in that process. But what's more common is that there's microscopic damage that's only caused by these very high pressures. So we went out to look to see if we could find evidence of that microscopic damage. And what did you find? Well, the only thing, as I mentioned, that one can study on the surface is this funny rock called breccia. Now, breccia, if you, for lack of a better phrase, if you took a whole five or six normal looking rocks and put them in a blender and poured it out and baked it, that's pretty much what a breccia looks like. A breccia has a lot of different pieces of other rock. In an impact setting, breccias form because when this impactor comes in, it literally partially melts and mixes and stirs up a lot of rocks. Some of them get thrown out of the crater and then they just land. And where they land, it's like you just poured something out on the ground and there it is. It turns into a rock over time. So we found a small amounts of this breccia exposed simply because it had been thrown out of the crater by about five kilometers. And we studied that and we found the common mineral quartz. And when we looked very carefully at that quartz, we found the evidence of shock deformation, these microscopic features that are a telltale sign of impact processes. 
This project was led by an undergraduate student, an honor student named Morgan Cox, and she did the hard work to find those quartz grains. The rocks being studied were primarily ejecta. What does that tell you about the, the crater itself? What can you learn about the likely size of the impact crater from looking at the ejecta that's been thrown from it? Ejecta is a wonderful material, and it's also wonderfully complicated. Again, when an impact happens, it pushes the crust of Earth down under great pressures, and when the crust rebounds back up, it often spits out a lot of rock and melt and vapor, and it can land in the vicinity or far away. In this case, the ejecta contains a lot of the material that tells us about what those rocks were in the subsurface. The problem with this site is that it's buried and covered by several hundred meters of much younger sediments and rocks. So in a way, unless you drill it or have some other means, you can't really tell what rocks are down there. It's in an area called the Perth Basin. And the Perth Basin has been explored for water and other things. And so people know a little bit about the geology of the Perth Basin, and we know what kinds of rocks we should expect to find down there. And in this case, because the crust had rebounded, rocks that normally are much deeper were much closer to the surface in drill core. So that was the first bit of evidence that something funny was going on. But when we examined the breccia, we could look at all of the different rock fragments, and we could tell, hmm, okay, we see a little bit of this sandstone, a little bit of this mudstone, a little bit of the siltstone and different kinds of rocks. And that also tells us what rocks were involved in the impact. This gets a little bit towards the age of the event, which is a tricky thing to try to peg. We pegged the age at about 85 million years, plus or minus a few million, by looking at what rocks were involved in the impact. So we knew if we see this particular unit involved in the breccia, that that unit had to be there in order to be hit and incorporated into the breccia. And so it provides a little bit of evidence on, okay, here's some regional rock units that we recognize as little bits and clasts and shards in this breccia. If it's in the breccia, it must have been deposited already at the time of the impact. And so it helps us narrow down the age. The best number we can assign to the age is about 85 million years, plus or minus a little bit. And so it puts it in a cool time period called the Cretaceous. Lots of dinosaurs walking around it's before all the dinosaurs got knocked out by a much bigger impact in Mexico at 65 million years ago. So they still had 20 million years of a good life ahead of them at the time of this impact in WA. Were you able to work out the size of the crater at all? Have you done enough core drilling to work out how big the impact crater would have been? Well, there were initially only one or two cores taken. And so they uh, made an estimate based on cores and a little bit of seismic data. Again, the company was exploring this for petroleum potential. And they came up with a value of around 12 kilometers in diameter initially. That's what they thought. Based on our data, once we confirmed uh, with shock minerals that it truly was an impact, we ran some numerical models. One of our members here at Curtin, Katerina Milkovich, ran numerical models that suggested it could be up to uh, 16 kilometers in diameter, which is a pretty gosh darn big hole in the ground if it were to happen today. It would be a city buster, no doubt about it. Does this tell you anything about the progenitor that created it? Well, we can... Based on modeling, we can kind of tell its size. It's probably, you know, a few hundred meters. But it's a little difficult to tell what kind of rock from space made the Yalali impact. And uh, that's a little trickier to get because you'd like to get either pieces of that meteorite or maybe some melt that might contain a little bit of melted meteorite in it. So it's a little hard to tell what kind of rock it was that hit it. Where to next? Well, in terms of Yalali, it's kind of great because finding new impact structures in Australia just adds to the geological heritage like MED. Prior to this discovery, there were 27 confirmed impact structures. This brings it up to 28. There undoubtedly are more impact craters in Australia all across that are waiting to be discovered. Including some of the biggest impact sites known on the planet. There's this huge one stretching from the far west of New South Wales well into South Australia. Yeah, there is a, a proposal from 2015. There may be what could be the largest impact yes. structure in Australia. And of course, this discovery in Western Australia wasn't the only one that your team was involved with. There was another discovery also published in the journal in Nicaragua. Tell me about that. Well, yeah, we, uh, we, we got pretty lucky on this one. Our results, we have lots of projects that run ongoing all the time, and we you know slowly do our detective work very carefully and methodically, and we don't release results until we're very confident of them. In this case, at about the same time, we released the results for the Yala Lee impact crater 
here in Western Australia, we also confirmed a new impact structure in Nicaragua in Central America. This one is called Pantasma, and interestingly enough, it's a similar size structure to the Yellow Lee. It's about 14 kilometers in diameter. This one's not buried, uh, but it has a complication that it's covered in jungle, and so uh, there's not a lot of good exposure. There's a little bit. But the major difference is it's much younger. It's been dated. We dated it here at Curtin. There was some glass that had been recovered from the site. Impact glass has a very lovely quality to it in that it's produced during the impact event, and then it's immediately quenched, and so meaning frozen. And so we can do uh, argon isotope dating to determine when that glass formed. And that was done at Curtin University, and the ages that were returned were about 800,000 years old. So it's not even 1 million years old, so it's very, very young. Now, before you can acquire ages for any kind of rock that you find, typically, but in this case, the important thing that went along with that was looking for evidence for that unique kind of deformation that only happens during impact. Our colleagues in France were driving this discovery, a guy named Pierre Rochette. He had collected pieces of this glass and some other rocks in Nicaragua a couple of years ago. And he contacted me and said, would you, we're, we're struggling to find some shock minerals, meaning that have that unique damage. Would you care to try to locate some in our materials? So I said, sure, send me some. And I was expecting a nice size rock. And what I got sent to me was something about the size of a marble. And I kind of gulped and I said, oh boy, <laughs> okay, not much to work with here, but we'll see what we find. And what we do to find, uh, in this case, it's a little bit different than looking at quartz. In this case, we polish the sample into a very smooth surface and we put it in an instrument called a scanning electron microscope. What we were looking for was, for one, can we find any minerals in here? Because the sample was about 99% glass and glass doesn't have minerals typically because it's a melt. And sure enough, there were a few minerals, and we found one in particular that we're quite good at called zircon. And zircon in impact environments and impact melts can undergo some pretty dramatic changes from normal zircons. Zircon's a common mineral that's in granites and other rocks, and people often use it to date when those rocks formed. So it's not an unusual mineral in that regard. But in impact environments, zircon changes. It can change its shape. It can do all kinds of funny things uh, and also have deformation features in the mineral. And if you're careful and know what you're looking for, you can recognize those things. And sure enough, we found some of that evidence in zircons that were in this glass. And that was kind of an aha moment because once you find those things, that's proof positive evidence. Those kinds of features in zircon, so-called shock zircons, they're not known to form from any other process other than impacts. And it doesn't take finding very many. We happened to find two grains, but that was enough. We were, we were beyond thrilled. That was able to push this over into the category of being a confirmed feature. So it's very young, very uh, reasonably large at 14 kilometers, and, uh, and it's one of the first and only impact structures known in Central America. So it's pretty exciting. That's Dr. Aaron Cavosi from Curtin School of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Physicists have for the first time witnessed the matter-antimatter asymmetry known as charge parity or CP violation in a particle known as a D0 meson. The discovery, described as a milestone in the history of particle physics, was presented at a seminar by CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. What the scientists had observed was a difference between the decays of matter and antimatter particles containing charm quarks. According to the standard model of particle physics, foundation stone upon which science's current understanding of the universe is based, equal amounts of matter and antimatter were produced when the universe burst into existence 13.8 billion years ago in an event commonly referred to these days as the Big Bang. Physics suggests there's almost no difference between matter and antimatter other than charge and magnetic properties. But when matter and antimatter come into contact with each other, they annihilate each other, producing high-intensity gamma radiation. Now, all this begs the question, if equal amounts of matter and antimatter were produced in the Big Bang, then why didn't the universe simply annihilate itself in a flash of purple light as soon as it came into being? And for that matter, why do we live in a universe filled with matter rather than antimatter? 
There's an abundance of evidence showing the observable universe is made up only of matter. If there were any large pockets of antimatter out there, it would have annihilated as soon as it came into contact with nearby matter, producing very highly detectable high-intensity gamma radiation, and this simply has not been observed. Therefore, figuring out how our universe ended up with an abundance of only matter is one of the biggest open questions in particle physics today. This new observation, by scientists with the LHCB collaboration, opens a new window into studies of the differences between matter and antimatter, and it could ultimately help explain why we live in this matter-dominated universe. CERN's Director for Research and Computing, Eckhart Elson, says that ever since the D-meson was discovered more than 40 years ago, particle physicists have suspected that CP violation occurs in the system. But it's only really now, using what is essentially the entire full data set collected by the LHCB collaboration, that the effect was finally observed. Mesons are short-lived subatomic particles, comprising a quark and its antimatter counterpart, an antiquark. All mesons are unstable, with the longest lived lasting only a few hundredths of a microsecond. Charged mesons decay to form electrons and neutrinos, while uncharged mesons can decay into photons. Quarks are elemental subatomic particles and a fundamental constituent of matter. They combine to form composite particles called hadrons, the most stable of which are the protons and neutrons which make up the atomic nuclei. Now, due to a phenomenon known as colour confinement, quarks are never directly observed or found in isolation, but instead they're only ever seen in hadrons, which exist as either baryons, such as protons and neutrons, or, as in this case, mesons. There are six known types of quarks, known as flavours, up, down, top, bottom, sometimes called beauty, charm and strange. Up and down quarks have the lowest mass. The proton is composed of two up quarks and one down quark, while the neutron seems to be made up of one up quark and two down quarks. Heavier quarks rapidly change into simple up and down quarks through a process of particle decay, the transformation from a higher mass state to a lower mass state. Because of this, up and down quarks are generally stable and the most common type of quark in the universe, whereas strange, charm, bottom and top quarks can only ever be produced in high-energy collisions, such as those involving cosmic rays or in particle accelerators. For every quark flavour, there's a corresponding antimatter counterpart or antiquark that differs only in that some of its properties have equal magnitude but opposite sign. The term CP in charge parity violation refers to the transformation that swaps a particle with a mirror image of its antimatter counterpart, and the weak interactions of the standard model are known to induce a difference in the behaviour of some particles and their CP counterparts, an asymmetry known as CP violation. The effect was first observed back in the 1960s at the Brookhaven National Laboratory in particles called neutral K mesons. These particles contain a strange quark, Then, in 2001, experiments at the United States Department of Energy's Stanford Linear Accelerator and at the KEK laboratories in Japan also observed the phenomenon in neutral B mesons, which contain a bottom quark. The findings led to the eventual attribution of two Nobel Prizes in physics, one in 1980, the other in 2008. Physicists believe CP violation is an essential feature of the universe, needed to induce the process that, following the Big Bang, established the abundance of matter over antimatter that we observe in the universe today. The problem is, the size of the CP violations observed so far in standard model interactions are simply far too small to account for the present-day matter-antimatter imbalance, and that suggests the existence of additional as yet unknown sources of CP violation. That's because so far CP violation had only been observed in particles containing either strange or bottom quarks. But these new observations involve the D0 meson, which is composed of a charm quark and an up antiquark. These observations have confirmed the pattern of CP violation described by the standard model in the so-called Kabibo Kobayashi Miskawa or CKM mixing matrix, which characterizes how quarks of different types transform into each other by way of weak interactions. The deep origin of the CKM matrix and the question for additional sources and manifestations of CP violation are among the big open questions of particle physics. The discovery of CP violation in the D0 meson is the first evidence of this asymmetry with the charm quark, adding new elements to the exploration of these questions. To observe this CP asymmetry, the LHCB researchers use the full data set delivered by the Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest atom smasher, to the LHCB experiment between 2011 and 2018. 
They look for decays of the D0 meson and its antiparticle, the anti-D0, into either kaons or pions. Looking for these two decay products in the LHCb sample of D0 particles provided the degree of sensitivity to measure the tiny amount of CP violation expected for such decays. Measuring the extent of this violation then boiled down to counting the D0 and anti-D0 decays and taking the difference. The result has a statistical significance of 5.3 standard deviations, thereby well and truly exceeding the standard threshold of 5 standard deviations, or 5 sigma, used by particle physicists to claim a discovery. This measurement will stimulate renewed theoretical work to assess its impact on the CKM description of CP violation built into the standard model, and will open the window to search for possible new sources of CP violation using charmed particles. Located at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, is a 27-kilometre long ring buried 100 metres beneath the Franco-Swiss border near Geneva. Part of a large complex of particle accelerators, synchrotrons and other high-energy laboratories, the LHC includes four massive detectors called ATLAS, ALICE, CMS and LHCB, each located in a massive underground cavern around the detector. The Large Hadron Collider works by firing packets of protons or other subatomic particles to within 99.999% the speed of light in opposite directions in two particle beamlines around the ring guided by cryogenically cooled superconducting magnets. Beamlines can intersect at any of the four particle detectors, colliding the particle packets at some 13 tera-electron volts and creating the sorts of conditions, pressures and temperatures that occurred just after the Big Bang 13.82 billion years ago. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Astronomers have discovered two colossal chimneys funneling material from the vicinity of the Milky Way supermassive black hole into two huge cosmic bubbles. The giant bubbles were discovered back in 2010 by NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. One bubble stretches above the plane of the Milky Way galaxy's disk and the other below it. Looking side on, they form a shape akin to a giant colossal hourglass that spans some 50,000 light years with about half the diameter of the entire galaxy. You can think of these gamma-ray bubbles as well, sort of giant burps of material from the central regions of our Milky Way, where its central black hole, known as Sagittarius A star, resides. Now, the European Space Agency's XMM Newton Space Telescope has discovered two channels of superheated X-ray material streaming outwards from Sagittarius A star, and finally linking the immediate surroundings of the black hole and the bubbles together. The study's lead author, Gabriella Ponti from the Max Planck Institute, says astronomers have known that outflows and winds of material and energy emanating from the galaxy are crucial in sculpting and altering the galaxy's shape over time. These are key players in how galaxies and other structures form and evolve throughout the cosmos. And our Milky Way galaxy gives astronomers a nearby laboratory to explore this phenomenon in detail, letting them probe how material flows out into space from the black hole. The authors used data gathered by XMM Newton between 2016 and 2018 to form the most extensive X-ray map ever made of the galaxy's core. The map showed these long channels of superheated gas, each extending for hundreds of light years, streaming above and below the plane of the Milky Way. Astronomers think that these are actors were well, sort of exhaust pipes through which energy and mass are being transported from our galaxy's heart out to the base of the bubbles, replenishing them with new material. The finding clarifies how the activity occurring in the core of the galaxy, both present and past, is connected to the existence of the larger structures around it. The outflow could be a remnant of the galaxy's past, from a period when activity was far more prevalent and powerful. Or it may prove that even quiescent galaxies, like those hosting relatively quiet supermassive black holes with moderate levels of star formation, like the Milky Way for example, can still boast huge energetic outflows of material. Mind you, despite its categorization as quiescent on the cosmic scale of galactic activity, previous data from XMM Newton has revealed that the Milky Way's core is still quite tumultuous and chaotic. Dying stars explode violently, throwing their material out into space. Binary stars whirl around one another and Sagittarius A star, a monster black hole containing the equivalent of 4.3 million times the mass of our Sun, which is lying there in wait for incoming material to devour later belching out radiation and energetic particles as it does so. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. (music) 
As well as ushering a change of seasons, the March equinox has also brought with it a so-called supermoon. The event happened just four hours after the moment of equinox, the closest since March in the year 2000. And it will be another 11 years, in 2030, before the two events will again be less than a day apart. Well, just think of that, we're now closer to 2030 than what we are to the year 2000. Oh, by the way, this was also the third and final supermoon for 2019. The term supermoon was invented back in 1979 by an astrologer, not an astronomer. For those unfamiliar with the difference between the two, an astronomer is a person who studies space and the cosmos using the scientific method to learn about the universe. An astrologer is a person who uses inaccurate positions for constellations, planets and other celestial bodies at different times in order to tell people about their character or to predict their future. There has never, ever, 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 ever been any scientific evidence supporting any of the claims made by astrology, and its success depends exclusively on the gullibility of people. Now back to the science. On average, the Moon orbits about 384,400 kilometres from Earth. But the Moon's orbit around the Earth isn't a perfect circle, it's slightly elliptical, meaning one part of the orbit will be a bit closer to the Earth, about 357,000 kilometres, known as perigee and the other part of the orbit will be a bit further away, around 406,000 kilometres, known as apogee. The difference is about 5% closer or further away on average. The exact distances of perigee and apogee also vary due to other factors, such as whether the lunar orbit's long axis is pointed towards the Sun. Also, the Moon's orbital extremes are greatest between November and February, when the Earth's orbit places the planet and its Moon closer to the Sun. You see, Earth's orbit itself is also elliptical, by about 2%, and therefore the Sun's gravitational influence is greatest during these months. Now, technically, these would be perigee and full moons. But trendoids, who use terms like woke, use the description of supermoon to describe any new or full moon within 90 degrees of perigee. Sensing an opportunity, NASA has now adopted this term as a means of educating the public about astronomy. 2019 will be an excellent year to look to the sky and enjoy the spectacular view of Earth's nearest neighbor, the Moon. Fifty years ago, we witnessed one of humankind's most remarkable achievements when we first stepped foot on the dusty surface of the Moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. As NASA continues celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo program, the year is opening with a number of opportunities to marvel at Earth's original satellite. Three supermoons and a total lunar eclipse in the span of three months. So, what is it that makes a supermoon super? Start with size. The moon orbits around the Earth in a slightly oval shape. At its furthest point away from us, known as the apogee, it's about 250,000 miles or 400,000 kilometers from Earth. When it's closest to us, its perigee, the Moon is about 220,000 miles, or 350,000 kilometers away. When the Moon is full at or near its perigee, it is considered a supermoon and can appear up to 14% larger and 30% brighter than at apogee. Those distances, however, are changing as the Moon is slowly drifting away from Earth. How slowly? Approximately 2 inches or 5 centimeters annually. A billion years from now, the Moon will take about 31 and a half days to orbit the Earth, instead of today's 27.3 days. In the meantime, this year's first supermoon of the year occurred on January 21st and also featured a total lunar eclipse. The second occurred on February 19th and sky watchers another chance on March 21st. While supermoons and total lunar eclipses are marvels to behold, a question rises 50 years after humankind's first steps on the moon. Does it hold any more secrets for NASA scientists? Noah Petro, project scientist for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center says there are many unanswered questions about the moon. For example, we are still attempting to understand how the moon evolved to its current state. The moon has occupied space near Earth for its entire four and a half billion year history, keeping record of the impacts that have scarred on its surface over time. This record of ancient impacts is largely erased from the Earth due to wind, water, and plate tectonics. Analysis of Apollo samples shows that there was a period of intense impact cratering on the Moon early in the history of the solar system, and therefore 
on the early Earth as well. Observations from LRO, now in its ninth year of orbiting the Moon, are helping us piece together this history. People say supermoons look especially big and bright compared to regular full moons. But while it can be around 14% larger and 30% brighter, you really wouldn't notice the difference unless someone told you. And even then, any size difference perceptions you do have will be more likely due to your imagination. In reality, you'd really need proper astronomical equipment to measure the difference. And remember, the full moon always looks large and bright when it's near the horizon, an effect known as moon illusion. The other important point to remember is that supermoons aren't all that uncommon. They usually occur in groups of three, roughly about every 13 months and 18 days. In other words, roughly every 14th full moon will be a supermoon. Now, one consequence of a supermoon that should be noticeable involves ocean tides. Many factors influence tidal heights at a given location, though they are usually highest, something known as spring tides, during full moons or new moons when the Earth, Sun and Moon are all aligned. So, a perigee moon being a bit closer than average should result in a slightly higher high tide. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has found compounds in coffee which may inhibit the growth of prostate cancer. The findings presented to the European Association of Urology Congress in Barcelona are based on the effect of two compounds found in coffee, kawal acetate and cafestol, and showed they were able to inhibit growth in cells resistant to common anti-cancer drugs. The two compounds are naturally found in Arabica coffee, but how the coffee is made can determine whether they're present in the final brew. A European study has found that people who used dope on a daily basis were three times more likely to be diagnosed with psychosis compared to people who had never used the drug. The findings reported in the Lancet Medical Journal show the link was even stronger in cities where super-strong weed was widely available. In fact, researchers say half of all new cases of psychosis in Amsterdam and a third of cases in London were linked to high-potency marijuana use. Paleontologists have just reported the discovery of the world's biggest Tyrannosaurus rex. The fossilised remains also qualifies the largest dinosaur skeleton ever unearthed in Canada. Scientists with the University of Alberta say the 13 metre long T. rex, nicknamed Scotty, lived in prehistoric Saskatchewan 66 million years ago. Scotty's nickname for the celebration bottle of Scots consumed the night it was discovered. The giant theropod had leg bones, suggesting a living weight of more than 8.8 tons, making it bigger than any other carnivorous dinosaur ever discovered, and that includes Spinosaurus, which paleontologists now believe had a mass of around 7.9 tons. And it's not just size which sets Scotty apart. It's also the oldest known T. rex based on its bone growth patterns. See, usually T. rexes grow fast and die young, but a careful examination suggests Scotty was in its 30s when it died. As well as an unusually long life, this T-Rex also had a typically violent one. Scotty's skeleton was riddled with pathologies, scarred bones with major injuries, broken ribs, an infected jaw, and what may have been a bite from another T-Rex on its tail, all battle scars from a long life. It's been revealed that the once popular Yahoo-owned social media blogging platform Tumblr has lost nearly 100 million views per month since banning blogs hosting adult content. The 17% decline in just 30 days saw page views drop from 521 million in early December down to below 437 million in January. While the problems of porn popping up on blogs on Tumblr are the same as on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and other blogging platforms, Tumblr took the unusual nuclear option of simply starting over rather than simply ridding sites of what they saw as offensive content. The move was highly criticised for breaking up safe spaces for women and marginalised communities, and that Tumblr's language and its ban was also inherently sexist. However, as well as losing page views, the changes also caused other problems. The anti-porn algorithms Tumblr are using are old and heavily flawed, wrongly detecting images which have nothing to do with porn, while at the same time still allowing some highly offensive pornographic material through a back door, no pun intended. Well, in what may be a case of going from rocket to rocket fuel, Chinese scientists have converted plant waste from agriculture and timber harvesting into high-density aviation fuel with far more complex compounds than previously created. 
A report in the journal Jewel claims researchers converted cellulose, that's part of the plant cell walls, into a high-density fuel that can be used either as a whole cell replacement for fuel, such as ethanol is now, or as an additive to improve the efficiency of other jet fuels. The authors claim their new biofuel could be instrumental in helping aviation go green. So, what's your air conditioning currently set at? Most homes, as well as businesses and transport systems, usually have their HVAC set at a comfortable 21 to 22 degrees Celsius. And a study in the journal Royal Society Open Science now knows why. Researchers found that indoor air conditioning settings are set to most closely resemble the climate of what is actually West Central Kenya, which just happens to reflect the temperature and comfort zone of most primates. Researchers looking at 37 houses across the United States found the average temperatures of home air conditioning units match the climates in regions in which our ancestors first evolved. They found the indoor climates of our homes largely match the temperature range at which humans and other primates can control their body temperatures without using up too much energy. The authors say the simplest explanation for all this is that people are simply trying to recreate the conditions from which they evolved. The Pharmaceutical Society of Australia has recommended that community pharmacy banner and buying groups should cease all activities that encourage the stocking, promotion, recommendation or marketing of homeopathy products. Homeopathy was first invented in Germany in the early 19th century as an alternative medicine. Despite hundreds of scientific studies showing homeopathy doesn't work and has no beneficial effect, it's still become a multi-million dollar international industry. The Pharmaceutical Society of Australia's national president, Dr Chris Freeman, says many people still aren't aware that there's no reliable evidence for the use of homeopathic products. He says public health is put at risk if people choose homeopathy over treatments that evidence shows are safe and effective. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says when people see homeopathic products in pharmacies, they could wrongly conclude that it has de facto endorsement. This is a policy put forward by the uh, Pharmaceutical Society, which is a society of pharmacists, the people who actually work in pharmacies. And basically they put forward a recommendation that pharmacies remove all homeopathic products from their shelves. If they don't remove the products from the shelves, at least they could advise their customers that these things don't work. It's been obviously controversial as far as the homeopathic movement goes, Fair enough. And a lot of the old med would see this sort of censorship of their products. But you know, in the same way as you wouldn't have sort of... I have I mean, <laughs> I have thank you. Yeah, on your shelves to cure warts. That sort of stuff that you might have there. The PSA recommends that uh, anyone who's like a pharmacy buying group, the people who buy through pharmacy chains who buy in all these products, they recommend that you should draw a line in the sand and cease all activities that encourage the stocking, promotion, recommendation or marketing of homeopathy, which is pretty all-encompassing. So basically they're saying you should not have homeopathic products on your shelves because they don't work. And they say if anyone wants it, you should discuss the lack of benefit with patients and that, that's their recommendation. So it's a pretty much a forthright um, advice from them. It's not a, it's not, it's nothing they can actually control or demand, but it's a pretty strong advice. As opposed to the Pharmacy Guild, which is the organisation of pharmacies or managers of pharmacies, so it's the shops as much as the people, they haven't been quite as overt. The problem there is while most homeopathy is harmless, let's face it, it's water, not even flavour water, uh, uh -huh. that uh, every now and then they do put additives in which can be dangerous. So it's either not going to do anything for you at all, or if it does, it'll, it could well be dangerous, it could poison you. They run a gamut of additives that are in there, and um, yeah, one of them was pus was one of the additives that in some homeopathic treatments, because of the basis that supposedly like cures like, so if you have a problem with pus or in infected um, issues with that sort of thing, that you have a pus in a treatment that will then cure it. And I'm thinking, no... <laughs> It is dangerous. It's also dangerous from the point of view that if you believe homeopathy is going to cure you, like homeopathic vaccines, yeah, that, that, that is a danger because you're not taking the proper stuff. That does work. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom from spacetimewithstuartgary.com or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast -coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. and available around the world 
on TuneIn Radio. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.